Hey, before we get started, uh, I, I got to give uh, props to Mr. Popey, who pointed me out to this pretty sweet deal uh, over by Googs. Uh, you can get two gigabytes of additional Google Drive storage if you just Ooh. do a security audit checkup on your Google account. Really? Which seems like kind of a good idea anyways, right? Well, yeah. I they're mean, paying me to do something I should be doing anyhow. Yeah. yeah. You know you're not okay. supposed to call it the Googs anymore, right? Right. We got in trouble Googs. for that, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, what, what was the problem with that? Hold <laughs> on. I got to hear the story. Uh, there's just people are complaining, as usual. People don't like it. Oh, I guess, well, yeah, people complain about System D, but we like that, so No, whatever. I guess Googs is actually like a slam term in some areas. Like Oh, oh, it's a cultural thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't okay. know that. See, I got Googs from I Google. That. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Google. Yeah, no, actually, uh, Googs is actually kind of an endearing term. And meanwhile, Noah's sitting there saying, Googs, he's the guy that walks around wearing Google Glass. Yeah. No, well, I, it, I, I, a good comparison is if you walk Google. into a house in the 70s in the U.S. and you say, wow, look at that shag. You're talking about carpet. You do that in the U.K., I'm pretty sure you're talking about two people doing the mo funky monkey. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's cultural. It's cultural. Uh, you could call it Google. <laughs> I, I like oh, Google. It's like it's like if Google and I uh, were like lovers, it'd yes. be like oh Googs. Like that would be my yeah, that would be my love nickname for Google. Well, a term of affection. There's, there's really here's ah. the thing, Chris. Because I always have to start stories with here's the thing. The <laughs> I thing found is, that the thing always, is that always. I don't ever call anything by its actual name. I don't call Walmart Walmart. I call it Wally World. I don't yeah. call Google yeah. Google. I call it Googs. I mean, I have abbreviated names for everything. It's an opportunity and, for fun. Right. right, they might they might be confusing it with that word. So I do Duke. the same thing. I call mate, mate, uh, and yeah, so gross, no, no, no. It's yeah. <laughs> two. It's two two distinct syllables. It's supposed to be mate. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Mate. Pay attention to feedback, Chris. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I run it. And I still I, can't get it right. Once, yeah. once again, uh, I can't help but point out that. All of you will say something wrong at some point, and so long as you get the message across, it doesn't really matter how you say it. Oh, oh that's, that's, that's way too rational. That was so beautiful. I know. That actually made me feel better about myself. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's definitely stuck in the Pacific Northwest rain. My name is Chris. And my name is Soggy, or Matt, yeah. as they also know me. <laughs> no kidding, right? I uh, it, it was really nice. Uh, my uh, wife and kids stopped by a few minutes before the show started. And, uh, you know, that's that's a nice treat uh, when they show up in the middle of the day. One of the benefits of working for yourself, I suppose. But you know what wasn't so nice? <laughs> What's that? I, you know, I go out there to be, you know, to say goodbye and, you know, just, sure. just you know, get everybody all situated, buckle in the kids. And uh, I wore my jacket. And in that time, I got rain. It is a pretty heavy jacket. I got rain through my jacket, and the shirt underneath I'm wearing got totally soaked. So I'm standing here wow. wearing wet clothes. <laughs> Man, you know, they, they, uh, that's funny. They have these things on sticks that apparently project the rain around you. I, I think they're called umbrellas. Huh. <laughs> and living in Washington, I'm just, you know, I'm just putting you think that I, I should have stock. <laughs> Well, it's it's manly in in this day and age to have an umbrella. It's no longer like a sissy. <laughs> we thing. could do it that really now. Is. Okay, good. Yeah, good. It's good. totally okay. Black umbrella, you're fine. Ah, uh, well, Matt, we have a great <laughs> show today. Umbrella notwithstanding, uh, later on in the, today's show, after we get through the feedback, we're going to talk about Ubuntu Phone. Uh, it's here. It's real. Uh, starting next week, you'll be able to pre-order yourself a BQ phone or an Ubuntu Touch. We'll give you more details about that, what the pricing is going to be, what the software situation looks like right now. We're going to pick up Popey's ear on, on the launch event. They had an insider's event. I don't know what the heck that means, but I know people got their hands on special units. That also sounds very interesting. We'll talk <laughs> yeah, about that yeah. in the show. Uh, and then uh, we're going to really do a deep dive on this because normally we would uh, cover a lot of this in the Linux Action Show on Sunday. Uh, but Linux Action Show this week was pre-recorded, so we didn't get a chance to fit this in. So there's so much to talk about. So we're going we're gonna to go in uh, deep on that this week. But first, got to talk a little about OwnCloud. Uh, 8.0 just came out. And uh, I wanted to kind of uh, noodle around uh, with uh, the Mumble Room, see who's in the Mumble Room using the own cloud. So let's bring them in. Time appropriate greetings, Mumble Room. Hey, guys. Hello. 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 Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Greetings. Hey, ho. So uh, we got a great note in the subreddit from uh, Seal20. And uh, he's talking about Kiss from a Rose. I was wondering how many people use own cloud in the last community and for what? With the release of 8, I thought it'd be nice to ask the community. I'll start by describing my use case. He's got it on a CentOS 6 VPS, own cloud 7, soon to be version 8. He uses the obviously the core own cloud components, the contacts, the gallery, the documents, the tasks, news, music, chat, calendar, all that stuff. He's got six users on it. He's using mobile apps, using CalDev and CardDev and own cloud sync. Completely, he's using it as a complete replacement for Dropbox, almost a complete wow. replacement for Google. He shares photos with it, shares files that are too big for email. 
isn't currently using encryption, has about 300 gigs in own cloud. Uh, anybody in the mumble room currently experimenting with own cloud, maybe done the upgrade to own cloud 8 by chance? I have own cloud. Uh, which do you know? Is it 7? I use it. Yeah, I'm still using 7. And what are you using own cloud for, Noah? I, uh, well, I start, <clears throat> unbeknownst to me, uh, you're not supposed to put all of your data into own cloud. It's not, uh, it's not <laughs> quite there yet. Oh. <laughs> so somebody forgot to tell me that. And so I put every last bit of it. I tried it <clears throat> for a couple of weeks first on my laptop and everything worked out great. So I moved all of my data that I carry in my laptop on a daily basis to own cloud. And for the first couple of months, I thought, I thought things were dandy every time I'd restore my laptop, which is, you know, once every three weeks or switch laptops, <laughs> I would, uh, I'd just sign into own cloud and all my files would show up. Sure. And then one day I went to look for a file and it wasn't there. And so I started doing, I started doing comparisons of the backups I'd made of my laptops and realized that over time I had just been slowly losing files. No. And then what, well, yeah. And then I brought it up to everyone thinking that everyone would have a solution. And everyone's answer was, well, yeah, you didn't know that, that, that happens with HomeCloud sometimes. <laughs> no. I blame PHP. Wow. Yeah. That's all. Well, so, uh, I'm kind of out on uncloud for the time being. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. I've noticed a lot of people online say I, I use own cloud, but I don't use the sync feature. Huh. Um, and, and, ah, right. and <clears throat> I think that's kind of how I use it. I do use own cloud sync. But I only use OwnCloud Sync for a directory that holds maybe 200 text files. And that's about all I sync. And a few pictures, things like that, that I'm using for in-production stuff. And then when it gets to heavy lifting for syncing, that's when I go BitTorrent Sync. And I use a dedicated sync system to handle a lot of file syncing. Uh, I have, too, had issues with OwnCloud. More in, like, I get all in and then I start hitting performance issues. Haven't had that as much with the later versions. Uh, so I've been bit a little bit by OwnCloud too, so I am a little trepidatious. What I use OwnCloud for today is CardDAV and CalDAV syncing. Uh, I use it for minimal file stuff. Like, uh, for example, we have art assets for our shows. Um, Women's Tech Radio or How To Linux or Linux Unplugged. There's, you know, you have PNGs of the logos and you have whatever the designers sent you the file and all this stuff that we need to share amongst people. OwnCloud's great for that. Um, Outside of that, I have ran into a few issues that have made me go kind of slow. Uh, and another one that we got in, uh, this kind of along the same thing, is uh, 19 Kster in the uh, subreddit. In big, bold letters says, read the documentation before you upgrade to OwnCloud 8. Uh, because if you just do a pseudo <laughs> apt-get yeah. upgrade, it could break your OwnCloud install. So there he gave some links what you need to read. So if you, go, if you are upgrading to OwnCloud 8 soon, uh, check that out. Anyone else in the mumble room want to share their OwnCloud story? Yeah, I've really never had a problem with own cloud. Um, I'm running own cloud seven on OpenBSD, mm. and um, it's a manual install of own cloud, not a not a distro install or anything like that. And honestly, I use it for syncing my files, and I've never had a problem in this. Uh, uh, quite a few of us that use it that sync across um, own cloud, different files, different folders, all that sort of stuff, and and I haven't noticed any any um, file drops or anything like that and and performance wise mm. it's been spot on so mm. no problems here Noah do you remember uh, what version of OwnCloud it was where you had data loss and I'm wondering if it was like if it was like 7 oh, seven. oh. Mm. oh I was going to say like if it was like version 6 or 5 I think that's when they in initially introduced file sync my question is uh, to the gentleman that was just speaking did you have you do you have any files that are over like 6 or 7 gigs and have you noticed any problems with those that's big. No, I don't. Tr I don't try to push that that size file um, in Australia. We our uplinks are absolutely pathetic, so we we sort of don't push big files. But I mean, sure. you know, I've got um, a couple of hundred meg files, and the checksums are still still spot on on those. Um, you know, they're ISOs. So, um, uh, I, yeah, from from my point of view, I don't move gigs. But that could be a PHP limitation where you've got yeah. a configuration issue yeah. of, yep. of of post. Yeah, that is that is something that people that are running on cloud installs often run into is like settings in their PHP config that prevent file size or timeout issues and things like that is a is a common issue. Um, and the guides yeah, do talk about that; they do address that. Yeah, I'm running it on Nginx with um, PHP FPM, so that's, oh, I bet that's, that's a, the only difference. I bet that's a well. I bet that's a pretty good setup, though. Huh. Yeah, from a performance point of view, yeah. it's stable. It doesn't uh, use uh, system, too much system resources. It's actually only running on a on a, a VPS of you know a 512 um, meg of RAM and you know 20 20 well I think 20 or 30 gig something hard disk, uh, so. something only you use or do you have multiple users? No, multiple users. Hmm. Very nice. Well, I'm glad to get this. So we got we got a little mixed input. Mine, 
Mine has been somewhere in between what Noah's experienced, but I have had some issues. So just take it easy and start. What I do is uh, whenever it comes to data like this, I start slow, you know, and, and, and I'm sure Matt would tell you to have a backup. Always backups for your backups. Yeah. And are you still are you still primarily using BitTorrent Sync, Matt? Are you kind of now, now I, are you been able to get off the what, Dropbox sauce? Because I'm having no, problems getting fully off the Dropbox sauce still. I tend to use Dropbox for more of a I, I won't say backup because that would be entirely accurate, but for more long term sending things back and forth as far as like uh, over the web. But as far as like oh, yeah. just on the land, BitTorrent yep. Sync is definitely what I do. It yep. just makes sense because it's easy. If something breaks, it's stupid easy to fix. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I just haven't had any problems with it. And I'm going to give a uh, obligatory plug for Sync Thing because we always get in trouble oh. when we don't mention Sync Thing. <laughs> yes, yeah. I just I happen- need to look into Thank that. You. Yeah, yeah I, I happen to like BitTorrent Sync a lot because I publicly yeah. share keys with folks and we sync over the internet. But if you if you don't have that requirement and you're like doing land syncing or syncing even not over land but just a few machines, Sync Thing is a very viable option. Yeah, I, I like BitTorrent Sync, especially when it comes to large files. It yeah. doesn't it doesn't give me grief. I don't have to worry about it. It just works, and I can walk away and go have coffee. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, it's easy. Hey, you know, one way you can make all of this work is with a DigitalOcean droplet, whether it's own cloud or BitTorrent Sync or even Sync thing. DigitalOcean would be a great place to host that. Head over to DigitalOcean.com right now. In fact, right after this, one of our next emails is somebody's hosting something really, really, really cool on DigitalOcean. And again, it gave me a great idea of something I might try, but I'll show that to you in a second. Uh, DigitalOcean, though, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect opportunity for you to play with something like this or put it in a full production like we do here at Jupiter Broadcasting. That's the great thing about DigitalOcean. Because of the value that they have, you can go, <clears throat> you can easily, easily justify going over there and, and setting up a machine Purely, purely for educational reasons, right? But because these are all SSD powered, because they have tier one bandwidth, because it's Linux and KVM, you could also put into full scale production like we do. Uh, and like uh, my co host on uh, Coda Radio does for his clients. He puts their client back end app stuff on DigitalOcean. And you can transfer those images around. It's great because DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to get started. You go over there in less than a minute. You'll have your own cloud server spun up, and pricing plans start only $5 per month for 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of frickin' transfer. That's amazing. And they have data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and London. So you can get that, deal, that geo diversity, go out there and set up your own CDN, or quite honestly, one of the things I use that for. And it's a small thing, but it, to me, it's like it's a nice thing I can do for the unfiltered audience without much cost, because it's just $5, is I have a droplet in New York, and I have a droplet in San Francisco, and I have a droplet in Washington, or I mean, I'm sorry, I have a server in Washington, and all three of them act as like a three-way CDN. So if you are in on the East Coast, you can pull from my East Coast server much faster than you're going to pull from my West Coast server. Uh, and if you're across the pond, you can pull from all three locations at the same time, and all of them come from different routes. So it's it's a really cool way that I did like a cheap, really kind of overnight BitTorrent Sync CDN. And it's is it perfect? Probably not. But man, does it do the job for five dollars a month? Plus, I've got other stuff running on that rig, and I'm always setting up new droplets because it's so quick to get started. That interface, it's like it's no it's no barrier at all. I can just sit down and get working because the control panel is so crazy intuitive. And you can replicate the control panel on a larger scale with their API. So that way if you end up getting a lot of droplets, you can scale the management of those droplets using that API. Taking advantage of tools already created by the community or ones you create yourself if you got the skills. Plus, they've got great tutorials to help you get anything set up you need. This is really a great combination. They're taking Linux, right? They're taking SSDs. They're taking all this tier one bandwidth and these connections that they've managed to get in these great data centers. And they've brought all of it together with incredible customer service, a expanding community that means great apps, great tutorials, incredible value, backed by Linux. It's, it's awesome. DigitalOcean.com. But here's the thing. We got a promo code for you. And you can use the promo code DO Unplugged. DigitalOcean Unplugged. DO Unplugged. Lowercase. All one word. DO Unplugged. Get a $10 credit. Try out the $5 rig. Two months for free. And see all the things you can do with it. Go deploy something amazing that's all yours. It's extremely gratifying. DigitalOcean.com, D-O Unplugged, and you get that $10 credit. Try out the $5 rig two months for free or go all in on Big Boy. Absolutely. You know, something here I did recently as I was working with a client, and they were looking at setting up something with Moodle. And I was like, oh, well, you know, I can set Moodle up. And when I was Googling around, sure enough, they had a, a, t- a DigitalOcean oh, yeah. tutorial <clears throat> written for it. Very, very yeah. awesome. And it was cool because I could go through with this client and actually show them how it was being set up and what all these things meant and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. It was very awesome. Yeah, you know, and that is a nice peace of mind for them, too, is... I'm mm-hmm. going to set this up on a DigitalOcean droplet. Right. If you and I ever part ways, you're not high exactly. and dry. They've got all of this yep. information for you. And you can, yeah, that is slick. And, you know, more and more, 
when I'm searching for stuff, I'm seeing the uh, DigitalOcean tutorial show up in the search results because they're just they're just great. Uh, so David my writes favorite, in. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Go no, I was gonna say my favorite part was where they're like, oh hey, that's great, but you have control over it because it's on your droplet. And like, ah, but I don't. And yeah. I clicked a few buttons and sure and enough, it's yours. Yeah, it's your well, droplet. You got now. it. Yep. Oh. So David uh, set up something kind of cool on one of his droplets. Uh, he says, I'm a longtime fan of Lass, and I want to tell you about a project I have been working on. It's a website called DistroPlaza, running at www.distroplaza.com. You guys can go check it out while I talk about it if you want. And it lets anyone upload a torrent of any distribution for free. Every distro uploaded gets a download page, a forum, a blog, and a place for users to review the distro. Distributions also get user groups where they can use, where users can stay informed about what's going on with their favorite distro. Distro Plaza launched in January on DigitalOcean thanks to the awesome promo code JB provides. I would love to hear some feedback on Distro Plaza, and if you think any other features that would be good for Distro Plaza, I'd love to know. You can check it out at distroplaza.com. And so we're looking at it right here. And yeah. so the idea is you have a, you know, you have a distro you love a lot. You upload uh, the torrent. Uh, so now they're seeding the torrent here, or part of that. They give you the forms. Here's the official Ubuntu uh, forms. Here's their forms for it. Uh, here's blogs that would be specifically around uh -huh. Ubuntu. It's empty. I mean, it needs content. And the other thing is I think yeah. it needs content from outside sources. I don't think you can depend on self-generated content. That would be my feedback to Distro Plaza. But uh, it's kind of neat. It's a neat idea. It is a neat idea. Yeah, I could definitely see a direction where this could be really, really powerful. Like a one-stop place to get information, get the downloads. The thing is, this has been tried before, so you got to really figure out a way to do something different here, I think. Right, right. I, I, would, I would caution against – so I would go one direction or the other. I would definitely caution against the community aspect of it, unless you're vetting specific people that you trust or at least you know, know oh, yeah, aren't going to just yeah. spam, spam yeah, your stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could try that approach, but I think really the idea of showing folks – the, you know, you're this type of person, you should be looking at these distros, you're that type of person, you should be looking at that distros, and look at the other attempts that have been made and try and fine-tune that, dial it in a little better. I don't know. It'd See be where some maybe some previous things failed? Yeah, because there's some that have tried that aren't really that great. Um, this actually is very clean. I like the layout, so it, it's very promising. Mumble Room, any thoughts, any uh, advice mm -hmm. for our friend David who uh, wants to set up Distro Plaza, a place to feature distros and talk about them and download them? No, going once. Okay, nobody had. Well, there you go, David. You got Matt and I's advice, and the uh, the mumble room will check it out after the show, perhaps. You can, and you can too, listener. Distroplaza. dot com. Yeesh. One last topic, and then we're out of the feedback. I know, I know, but I want to give everybody a chance to chime in. I love the community interaction. Uh, in fact, it was one of the reasons why we started this show. It's well, actually the reason. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Will Sorry, writes in. Up. It sounded to me like Chris was pronouncing "you block" as "you block," but I think it's pronounced <laughs> "moo block." He's not even shitting. You know, the one that's spelt you block? It's actually oh, pronounced... Yeah. Well, obviously it's moo, yeah. like a cow. Because, I mean, clearly. see, it's actually a Greek <laughs> U, so it's pronounced oh, M-U, yeah. like a micro, since it's a lightweight... Regarding, but anyways, he says, back oh, to gosh. Adblock Plus. Uh, I started using <laughs> Adblock Plus shortly after it started, even back when there was no option to allow Google uh, text ads. Uh, he thinks that people care too much about the acceptable ads program that we talked about last week. Mm -hmm. It's easy to change subscriptions in Adblock Plus so that one doesn't have a whitelist ads if you don't want them. But I think Adblock Plus is playing with fire a little bit. It reminds me a bit of the net neutrality issue. Adblock Plus wants to provide, priv uh, to, to provide some privilege to some ads over others, resources or money, in other words, and are necessary to review ads and decide what is acceptable and when it isn't. They have chosen to let companies pay to be reviewed faster, which effectively means companies can get in ahead of other people. They will, stay, uh, they, they will say that prioritization does not impact their criteria for what is acceptable ad, but their money incentives for the program really don't line up with what is best for the user. And this is something I didn't realize. I didn't realize that I knew you could pay Adblock Plus not to be on their block list. I didn't know right. that you could pay Adblock Plus to grease the wheels a little bit. Sort of like when you're getting a passport and you want to, you want to rush it. <laughs> yeah. I well, see, here's thing. the... And I, I did, and here's why I don't care. Because I, I mean, I care in a sense, but I think it's important to really, really take this way. Until it's being bundled into browsers or forced onto people, uh, yeah, yeah, it'll yeah. take care of itself. I think it'll snuff itself out. I think he's going to pay a heavy price for it because I think it's a bad idea. But if it was pre-installed, yeah, that would be very scary. That would be very, that'd be frightening because then, it, then it is a net neutrality issue at that point. Yeah, and it is. You're right. Is the user's opt-in? So yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, but it definitely, I agree that it's a, it, it's a very shady, sleazy, not very long-term, healthy kind of approach. So, yeah, yeah. I, I still remain. I still, I think one of the reasons I wanted to read this email is I'm still pretty undecided on the whole ad blocking thing. I mean, obviously, we're this show is an ad supported show, and so I wouldn't want people to block ads on this show. I'm sure a lot of people skip them. I would hope they don't, uh, and we try to change them up a little bit so that way you won't. Uh, and it would it would hurt us. Like so, if if there was such a thing as ad block for podcasts, and ninety percent of the people listened, we would go out of business. 
Well, so here, when it comes to advertising, and this includes AdSense or audio ads, the thing you have to remember is, is that advertisement, does it have any slim potential of offering a true benefit to the user? Our ads do. We like them. We feel that they're awesome things that we're excited about, and we want to share them. Uh, even AdSense, to a limited degree, especially when it first came out, did potentially offer some advantage to a user. They go to a, a, a maybe a decor website. They're going to have decor ads that might help them enhance, enhance what they're wanting to do. Now, that being said, when you have flashing banners and pop-unders, mm. that's not a value-added situation. Mm -hmm. That needs to die in a fire. Mm -hmm. So... You know, so my philosophy on that is, you know, people are going to use these apps. They want to do that. That's fine. So in tech circles, yes, ad blocking is going to happen. Outside of tech circles, it's a mood issue. Hmm. Um, I think we're in a good position because our stuff is audio based and video based, where it's really not as not as big of an issue in that regard, except for obviously AdSense and things like that. But yeah, um, and I think you made a good point you know, too. Like it's to wash. It's on it, and this is. And then we'll get off this because it's not strictly yeah, related. Yeah, yeah. But I, I guess this is why I've kind of kept opting back to turning off ad blockers is mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. if the publisher wants to publish a full screen takeover ad, uh, then I want to be able to judge them for that. And so like one mm. of the, like you said, one of the things is we make sure like the ads we pick, there's not a single sponsor we have that, you know, we don't actually use. Like that's right, a big exactly. Deal. That's a big deal. We actually like these songs. We, it's not yeah. like we're just you know picking random people out of a hat, you know. So. Uh, and so yeah, that's that's where I think they so they cross the line. They sort of like uh, they sort of take the audience for granted in that regard, and they they shove right. too much in their face. And it's never it, it's it's it can't work when you when you do that much ads, it's noise. And that's why people I right. think res resort to using ad block. I think it's and it's most symptom. importantly, does it inhibit the user experience? That's when an ad block is acceptable. At any case, in any scenario, if it's in literally, legitimately inhibiting an experience. Now, a a quick commercial before a YouTube video is not inhibiting your experience. A few seconds in, it gives you the option to skip it, get over yourself. It's not yeah. that big a deal. Yeah, I but agree. if it's a big, but if you're on a mobile phone and you got that big ad that just covers up the entire screen and it's playing video and you can't find the X, that's inhibiting my experience. They yeah. need to. That needs to stop. Yeah, um, that's it. And now I'd like to take a moment to tell you about vitamins and uh, no I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. And power shakes. Yeah, Always oh, power shakes. Yeah, protein shakes. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, I we the mumble room's been pretty quiet on the ad issue. Anybody yeah. have any final thoughts before we close the book on this topic? Mumble room, this is your chance. Well, well you know, it's it, adverts on TV and um, podcasts and you know, radio or whatever, they're they're all a lot, a lot more difficult to um, get away from than adverts on the web. I mean, adverts on TV. Um, I used to have a PVR that actually had an advert skip button, and all it was was a, a one-minute forward skip. And I knew that I could go bam, 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 and forward skip through the TV adverts. And I had no moral compunction yeah, yeah, doing yeah. that whatsoever. Right. Yet the, the yeah, and there's a big TV company, and I'm paying for the delivery of that that service to my house anyway. Whereas yeah. an independent uh, content creator on the web, it's it's a different story. There's like sometimes one guy who's creating that website and maintaining it keeping it running yeah. running the server and creating the content as their full-time job and so i generally don't run ad block at all unless the site looks like a bag of crap like pharonix in which case i will block it <laughs> wait for that to come out yeah because yeah. <laughs> like so far that's totally that's totally larbelt like you're explaining these one guy he runs the whole thing he manages yep. all of that uh but Right, it's a tough line to walk, uh, and it's particularly hard. I mean, not to not to take this in a weird direction, uh, but it is particularly hard to monetize. Probably more hard than normal in the free and open source software community because in, oh god, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. So yeah. like, I mean, not necessarily. I mean, obviously, people are willing to pay with in the. I mean, look at the humble bundle and uh, our our Patreon. People are willing to pay when they feel there's value there. But I think some people are a little afraid of that and. I can understand and how people that. also pay when they're guilt tripped into it. I mean, look last week, right. what happened to the the GNU PG developer guy? Yeah, a new right. story comes out, yeah. and suddenly his his donation goes from like twenty thousand euros up to one hundred and twenty thousand euros in a day. And you know, when people feel guilty about it, then yeah, they they will throw a few coins in in sure to you know help maintain it. But often they won't do anything. You know, people will pay the minimum for for humble bundle, no matter what anyone says about the fact that Linux users pay more many people pay the absolute minimum yeah, yeah. Uh, they they need to so you know and everyone's in the same boat nobody yep. has like buckets of money to throw yeah. at this right yeah uh it's, a lot of things also try to get under google's example when it comes to things so yeah. they don't really know of many other alternative ways to fund their project they just 
do the, the Google way, ad, yeah. ad wise. Yeah. But I think having or asking or saying that you need something and if it's a really good project like, you know, GNU PG or Adblock, if you ask through users and you have a good product that's worth paying for, hell, I pay for it. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exactly how I feel too. Yeah. I'll make two points is I think that it really behooves the content creators to do their due diligence and um, looking into who's advertising and how they're advertising, such as you guys do. And the other thing is, you know, sometimes you'll get caught up in people using ad block because of all the sites that don't do that due diligence. And we have to be reminded to go turn it off for your pages. Mm -hmm. Well, and Reddit has a nice approach. If you use Adblock on Reddit, it says, hey, you know, you're, you're using Adblock, and that's cool. But if you don't use it, they actually have a little banner that appears that says, hey, thank you for not using Adblock on our site. Yeah. That's, that's the way to do it. I, I find that's Reddit ads are uh, pretty, uh, pretty acceptable. They're tame. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. really mind them at all. Um, yeah, and, and I do like being thanked for turning off Adblock. I, I know that's a stupid yep. thing, but I do kind of like it. <laughs> it helps. It's psychological. You can't argue no, with it. Like, you know? you know what? You're welcome. <laughs> And that's a really like a good point because that exact little thing is what's reminded me in some instances. Oh, I have ad block on yep. or you block yeah, on, yeah. and I need to go turn yeah. it off. Yeah, and I just whitelist them now. I yeah. mean, it's like I'm okay with that. Yeah, yeah, good point. Uh, all right. Well, uh, you know what? Uh, chat room wants to talk about it. Maybe in just a second before we get into the, we'll just real briefly, and then we'll get into the Ubuntu phone stuff. Chat room really wants to talk about this Raspberry Pi two problem. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah so oh yeah, we okay. We'll do that. We'll do that. I, I think we'll have a quick one on that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we, uh, you know what, we'll mention uh, one of our great sponsors, one of the ones that Absolutely. we use, one that I've used for over two years now. I've been a Ting customer for over two years. I think Matt's clocking up on that, too. Oh, it's got to be really yeah. close, if not. I mean, it's got to, I mean, really, it's yeah, it's got to be close. Two years. And so uh, I, I can say now, confidently, that uh, I am truly a Ting user, and I do recommend them. Start by going to linux.ting.com. That's going to give you $25 off your first device. Now, I'll tell you why that's a big deal here in a second. If you have a Ting-compatible device, and because they're adding GSM, there's more and more all the time time, uh, you're going to get a $25 credit. That credit might just pay for your first month. Here's why. No contract, no early termination fee. You only pay for what you use. What? You only pay for what you use. I know. I know. It's crazy. You're, you, here's what you're saying. You're saying, Chris, crazy things do crazy. They can't afford to do that. You know what? You're wrong. You're wrong. Kyra's here to tell you why. Ting keeps rates simple. We don't make you pick a plan. Instead, you just use your phone as you normally would. How much you use determines how much you pay each month. You can have as many devices as you want on one account. That's good, because when you use more, you pay less per minute, message, or megabyte of data. Your usage, plus $6 per active device on your account, plus taxes, is your monthly bill. Simple. That's what we mean when we say... Mobile. That makes sense. Yeah, go over to linux.ting.com to get that savings. Uh, by the way, remember how I said that $25 matters? Uh, every, from time to time, Ting gets some great deals in on MiFi hotspots. And they just got back in the Novatel MiFi 5580. Once you go to linux.ting.com, that's a $96 tri-band LTE hotspot. $96. You own that thing. It's not, it's not locked either. You own it. It's yours. And it's $6 for the line. You can even turn that off when you don't need it. And then you just pay for the data usage. Why wouldn't you just have that in your pocket? Now, they don't have this device all the time, so I mention it right now. Again, it's the Novatel MiFi 5580, $96 tri-band LTE hotspot with a LCD screen on the front that gives you your signal stats, your connected devices, your battery information, uh, what type of cellular network you're on. And this is great even if you just use it when you travel. This is an unbelievable value. And they've got every kind of device you'd want. Start by going to linux.ting.com. And if you have any questions, you can call them at 1-855-TING-FTW. Also, on their blog right now, if uh, and I know from some of the emails I've gotten, net neutrality and Title II are on your mind. Ting has been very upfront about their position and what they think is important in this debate and discussion. And they have another blog post up on their... It's, uh, it's ting.com slash blog. But start by going to linux.ting.com to read that. Uh, and they also, up on the blog, have a tip for how you can download Google Maps for offline use. If you're going to go somewhere where you don't have signal or you want to save some data, turns out there's actually a really great way to save the maps in Google Maps offline so you can get them without even a connection. They have that up on their blog as well. Linux.ting.com. And a big thank you to Ting for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. And thank you all of you for going out there and trying them. I can say I really do recommend them. Uh, and uh, by the end of February, things are really going to get crazy for Ting when they're, rolling out, when they're rocking GSM and CDMA at the same time. That is. Oh, crazy. it's going to be huge. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. Who else is doing that? Nobody. Exactly. Nobody else is doing that. Linux.ting.com. 
Okay, so real quick, uh, I guess it turns out this new Raspberry Pi 2 that we were talking about last week, if <laughs> if you expose it to a bright flash, like a Xeon flash, like on a camera flash, not just like a room, like you don't just turn on the light, but like you really expose it to a bright light, it like kills power to the device and causes it to reboot. So you can reboot a Raspberry Pi 2 by flashing a light at it. So b- what you're telling me is no Raspberry Pis can be used in porn studios, photography situations. I mean, like, so that's, <laughs> you know, that's that just, porn you just, you just, is that where you you I mean, you know, well, I got one in my basement, you know, right. I mean, oh, so you right. just totally killed my, killed my dream here. Right. I mean, it's like, oh my God, that just, that totally, see, I can't, that just totally changes everything. Now I got to go and get nuts or something. I know. I, I think uh. people just find this to be funny because it's probably not, <laughs> and I guess there's even like an epoxy paint people are already using yeah. to cover up the chip and, and make it so it's not, uh, a, yeah. but it's just, it's hilarious. Uh, oh, uh, in a go, go, uh, you have, uh, something to comment about lasers on the raspberry Pi. This sounds good. Um, but someone, I was reading on Reddit, someone also said the laser also affects the raspberry Pi and lasers? does the same effect. Lasers. Frickin' lasers. Here. Raspberry Pis with lasers that. on their head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I, I don't know what to make of this. Uh, but and I thought the people that, was, that adore them. I thought that was funny. Uh, so yeah, is it me or does it strike me as Jerry Springer in a way? Like you could actually have a Raspberry Pi sitting on a on a chair, and you know the other person with lasers and flashlights attached to them having this conversation. I don't know. The whole thing just seems silly. I was picturing like uh, like elite government agents who uh, take over uh, like. Uh, a Middle Eastern uh, compound that's using Raspberry Pis by going and flashing lights at the Raspberry Pis, causing their security grid to crash, and then they infiltrate and drop troops in, and and it's a big American, it's the next big American movie, and it all happened well, because they flashed lights at Raspberry Pis. Nice. Well, that's pretty in depth. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's right? where I was going. That's where I was going with that. Uh, all yeah. right. Oh, any other thoughts? They'll, they'll just put that in um, Black Hat too, or something. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Start advertising as a feature. You could. Yeah, you know, you could set up lighting in your in your server room where you have a bunch of Raspberry Pis, and you could flash the lights when you need all your servers to reboot. There you go. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, let's 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 talk about what we're all really here gathered today to talk about, and uh, that's this new BQ phone uh, that goes on sale next week. Uh, it's like around one hundred and seventy. Uh, I think what is it? Like probably like hundred. I don't know. About one hundred seventy-five dollars. I don't know what it's going for exactly. U.S. Uh, and um, there's even a little video. Now, I don't think there's a lot of words in this video, so I'll just I'll just put it up on the stream so we can look at it. I mean, it's a, it's definitely a very fancy video. After all of the waiting, I mean, it, it I know it's only been a couple of years, but it feels I mean, that's a long time. In the scheme of developing something like this, that's not actually a long time, but for right. people sitting on the outside, it feels like a long time. Uh, and so this is this video is extremely well done. I, Pope, I don't know if do you know any of the background on this video like this no, is- the first time I saw it was uh, last Friday. I'd, it was uh, it was shown off at uh, an event in London, and I'd never seen it before. And actually, that's uh, the bits where you see outside the guy on top of a building is actually on top of our office building. Um, you can, I can recognize certain, you know, parts of oh, London that's funny. in uh, in the video. Yeah. Well, I, I think, and we will have the video linked in the show notes. I think one of the things the video does really well for me is it it's essentially without being uh, too obvious about it, showing me. You know, kind of how Ubuntu Touch would sort of fit in with like the ideal daily lifestyle that, of course, nobody truly lives. But if you live that, like, it, I, I get like contextual information becomes available to me just by watching that commercial. Like, it's surprisingly effective. Life at your fingertips is the slogan. That's pretty good. This is really like well it, done. Yeah. I think so. I think they did a nice job with it. I think it's going to be interesting to see where it goes to. So the Aquarius E4.5, 4.5. It's 4.5 inch screen, huh? Well, so there you go. So the BQ phone, it's not like it's not a screamer of a phone. It's not going to blow you away with its stats. Uh, it's got a 4.5 inch screen. Uh, runs at uh, 540 by 960 resolution. 1.3 gigahertz quad core ARM Cortex A7 MediaTek CPU. A Mali 400 GPU at 500 megahertz again MediaTek. 8 gigabyte EMC storage. 1 gigabyte of RAM. 2150 milliamp battery. Dual micro SIM and an 8 megapixel rear shooter. Uh, as far as first goes, it's not bad, especially if you consider that, you know, for a certain sector of the market, that's plenty of phone. I don't oh, yeah. It, I, don't oh, yeah. Me, but. I think anyone coming into the smartphone space for the first time is going to be pleasantly surprised. And I think that's really where they're going to hit their sweet spot. Now, that's where I would target. I think that seems like that's what they're doing. Now, it's not launching in the U.S. yet. Yeah. Um, but uh, mm-hmm. it is available. It'll be mm-hmm. available. I wonder, I wonder if I'll still be able to buy it. I don't know. So the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> 
the event that happened last uh, Friday, there were 30 people invited from is, this is the insiders places event? around the world. Quote, unquote. Yeah, it was called the yeah the Insiders event, the Ubuntu Insiders. They were actually invited uh, a couple of months ago. We built a list of people that we thought might be interesting to come along and, and see it. And there was a couple of journalists, a couple of video bloggers, um, and some... Um, some like blogger bloggers like written bloggers and um members of our community developers and what you might call outsiders uh, from the community um just to come along and we give them a phone and they get to be the the first people with one of these devices we also gave them a few little tidbits of information over the over the month leading up to it uh, and then we flew them out to London on uh, on Friday, and they uh, they came and saw the uh, that video and a couple of talks by uh, there was a guy from BQ there. There was uh, a couple of people from Canonical giving talks. Um, it was really good fun. Had a and, few beers, and they yeah, they got to leave a with a phone, right? Yeah, we gave them all the phone, uh, and uh, it was in a special presentation yeah. origami presentation box. Um, there was a phone yeah. and a. Uh, a pair of nice headphones. Yeah, and it even um, it even warranted uh, the Ubuntu phone's first official unboxing video, which OMG Ubuntu picked up and ran. That Ubuntu yeah. phone box is slick. I gotta say, that's a nice it looking was, box. Yeah. It was funny. The um, the we were asking them, look, do you mind if we video you um, <laughs> opening? Because we, you know, we know what it's like. You know, people yeah. want to see the thing unboxed. Yeah. yeah. And so the video that you're showing now of um, that's Jordan Keys uh, unboxing yeah. his uh, his he actually ran back to his hotel room <laughs> or ran back to another room in order to <laughs> to do that. And then we went out for beer in the evening while his video was rendering out. And then he uploaded it to YouTube when he got back after a few beers. Good so, sport. Um, good yeah, sport. It was it was it was a good it was a good day. Um, I noticed and, too. I noticed that they come with a uh, uh, the uh, the Insiders Edition came with a very nice set of just headphones, like an extra perk there. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. We wanted to give them a little bit of something extra to say thank you for taking part and uh, and you know uh, coming all the way to the UK. I mean, some of them flew over, some of them didn't have fast come, but uh, it was nice of them to come over and just take part and uh, and give us feedback as well. You know, we've been capturing feedback from them. It, it, you know, I, I was walking around on the Friday with a notebook, old style paper notebook, and <laughs> right now, people were saying, hey, Popey, what about this? And how does that work? And why is this like this? And I was making lists and, you know, I've been giving feedback to developers and filing bugs like you know doing all the due diligence because these are the first people that have seen them outside canonical we've all seen it evolve you know i've had one of those phones since august last year and oh, wow. i use it every day but there are things you just don't notice and then when someone walks up mm. to you and goes oh why why is it doing allowing me to do this and you think oh wow yeah you're right yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, uh, you, it's just something because you use it every day you just don't think that's yep, weird very you much. shouldn't do that yeah very much so that is very true so so actually they they go on sale as a flash sale starting tomorrow which is wednesday the 11th of february at 8 uh eight o'clock utc so it's nine central and if, so european time flash sale means only gonna be available for a limited time are suckers like me are, are we gonna be able to buy it or is it only gonna be a, is it region it's locked all you know? day so it's nine nine central uh european time till six central so eight till five utc um so yeah it's a fairly lengthy amount of time throughout the day it's not like you know a 10 minute flash sale it's not like yeah, the whole right, car, yeah, yeah. world has to ddos so i might actually website for the day I'm, I'm, uh, you could try. I have a shot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm certainly going to bed early so I can get up. It's like Christmas for me tomorrow because I'm going to be ordering one. Obviously. Yeah. Um. You know, we're we're all going to be ordering them. Are you pretty excited? Yeah. It's it's, you know, the fact that, that you know I started working at Canonical three years ago, knowing that this was going to happen, and it's taken a long time for us to get here. And we've, you know, we've had a lot of flack along the way, and the method by which we've developed this, and the software choices that we've made and the the hardware specification of the first device you know this remember this is the first ubuntu phone right uh hopefully one of many devices you know if we come back on um unplugged episode 600 there'll be you know a plethora of these sure. phones out there sure. who knows you know are you already know. looking at the next device a little bit because i know they yeah, yeah we've already said the next one is the meizu yeah. 
Yeah, MX4. that one's going to be a little more uh, like a larger screen, right? One thing, and uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's quite a bigger screen and more. It's uh, more cores, more RAM, yeah. you know, yeah. more and bigger of everything. But um, yeah, you, at the moment you start we're just somewhere, totally focused on the PQ. One. How how important was it? Uh, you know, you mentioned that you've had one iteration of this, another since August. Is that part of why you know you got to start and you kind of have to lock in the specs at some place and then start developing for that? And so uh, this the BQ phone, yeah. It's, it's sort of been locked in for a while, I take it. Right. And so we initially were, you know, we've had loads of different hardware over the, the time that we've developed this. We started off with a tablet edition on an Asus Transformer mm. TF101. Yeah. And we've moved through very, a Nokia N9 and various Samsung Galaxies and Nexus devices. And, you know, then we got a partner in BQ. So we, we grabbed a bunch of those devices and we started doing the hardware enablement and making sure all the apps work. Because, you know, if we've been focusing on the Nexus 4, then we discover that, oh, actually, certain dialogues don't fit yeah. on the screen. Because I was wondering the, about yeah, that. this yeah. thing's slightly different. So, yeah. so so we have to make sure all our apps and the dash is responsive and you know scales down to, to devices of this size. And it's actually made us more disciplined. Having a device that has more constrained hardware resources is probably better for us. If mm. we'd have had the MX4 first mm. and had you know octo core with two gig of RAM, right. we could have gone nuts and you know made yeah. some decisions that actually we'd regret later because we'd have to try and scale it back. Whereas from what I'm told um even unoptimized on the mx4 it flies along i haven't actually got one myself Ooh, yeah. uh, but i'm told it flies along um and it's you know it's pretty good on this bq device and we've still got some more optimization to do um so yeah there's still work and we're still ongoing and and the good thing is that we continue to deliver updates to that device so even when we've moved on to the to the mx4 and the next device and the next device all the previous devices continue to get those updates god the mx4 looks so sweet wow this looks like a yeah yeah i mean i want the bq just to have the experience but i think the one i'm going to land on would be the mx4 this is an incredible phone i want them all yeah well sure of course (laughs) (laughs) it's like trading cards yeah hmm yeah exactly yeah so how, them all, how, them uh, how much how much energy do you do you suspect Canonical will put into uh, sort of like I don't want to know if a generic image is the right one, but an image that's essentially with some modifications that'll work on most smartphones. Is that something Canonical well, will ever you can't, do? You can't really do that yeah. because the ARM architecture doesn't so let you. Yeah. So there's there's a couple of things. You know, ARM doesn't really have the concept that the PC world has in terms of a CPI and device discovery, you know, that's that that's very mature on the PC and you can have one co-base stick a, a USB stick in it and it will boot auto discover everything and figure out what drivers to load at runtime. Um, and the second problem is most um, SOCs, most of the chips that are in phones have uh, binary blobs and you know that's that's sad and disappointing and but that's just the world we we live in right yeah, now yeah. there are no free soft fully free software phones none none whatsoever so whenever anyone complains at us that we're not a fully free software phone well good luck finding one well yeah if you um, want to if you want a phone that makes phone calls <laughs> right yeah or yeah. is usable yeah. in any way shape or form yeah um so we you know we we have to build um, an image that is use, you know, usable on a specific device. But that's that's actually where we've been quite cunning with this is that we have multiple layers to the to the um, image that goes on the f- on the phone. There's the very base layer, which is the device specific part, and that's you know there'll be a device specific bit for BQ, a device specific bit for the MX4, and then and, ongoing and, and practically, other devices. What is that? Is that is that a specific kernel? What what is that yeah. layer composed of? Yeah, so that's the that's effectively the kernel and the drivers for things like the GPU, the okay. radios, okay. and all that. The sensors, you know. So, so for example, if a device comes along that has a fingerprint sensor, just for the sake of argument, you know, we might want to support that, and that would be a device specific thing driver that yeah. would need to go in. Right. But okay. on top of that is the second layer, which is the user space bit, which has got all of our Ubuntu stuff in and the dash, and then on top of that is your apps, but also the the OEM or the carrier. Um, can put their own additional bit on top. So, so we control a bit in the middle. That's that's the um, the app the the APIs Ubuntu and all stack. the all the stuff people write. Yeah, towards. and the dash and the common bit that you would see across all the devices. The bit at the bottom is the device enablement, and so that means that when a new device comes out, all we need to do is do the device enablement, and then it's the same user space that runs on those. And so when 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 we want to update an old device, we just 
update the middle section and the device enablement bit stays the same. That's a really good approach. And you can it means, see it means we don't have that fragmentation that, that Android has. We have, you know, we can have lots of different devices on the market and they're all effectively running the same code. Well, and it seems like it's approachable by just a, you know, a fairly well organized community could come together and say, all right, well, we'll take on supporting the Nexus 4 for another couple of years or we'll make a Nexus 5 port. And me, as a more sophisticated user, could say, you know what, I know this community, I'll go use their image because. If I'm following you, the only thing they would really have to modify would be that first layer, that, that lower level bits, right? Right. And so someone has already created the Nexus 5 right. port, yeah, as yeah. you know. Yes. And, you know, it has issues. It's not perfect hardware-wise. We're going to continue to maintain the Nexus 4, Nexus 7, and Nexus 10. And then what other, wherever other devices come along that we have to support, you know, for uh, contractual agreement for things like BQ and Meizu and, and, and so on. Um, so we'll continue to maintain you know, a whole bunch of devices going uh, mm-hmm. going forward. Hmm. All right, I got a couple more questions, uh, and then uh, and then we'll open up the moment because I know they have a couple questions. This is really I I'm exceptional I'm exceptionally excited about this because I know we've all I uh, we've all just been watching this, and so uh, this is a really exciting first step. And I know the BQ phone isn't perfect. Maybe we'll talk about that too, and and kind of get uh, Popey's idea on sort of what expectations we should have, maybe performance wise, and uh, you know battery life and things like that. But first. I'll tell you about Linux Academy. Linux Academy is a sponsor that I think is truly great for our audience. Uh, and maybe it's I'm a little biased. Uh, I, I believe that when somebody or, or a group of people are extremely passionate about something, uh, if they can line up the right things, they can provide an incredible wealth of content and information. Um, and I think this is so, so perfectly demonstrated with Linux Academy. And to sort of validate this theory that I've been thinking of, I, I sort of look at the other larger outlets for sort of semi-equivalent content, and it's just a joke. They so obviously are checked out. They're not Linux users. They're not passionate about open source. They couldn't care, right? They're monetizing. And that's fine. There's a, there is room for that. But if you're spending your money, why not go somewhere called Linux Academy, created by Linux enthusiasts and open source professionals who truly believe in this stuff, who combine with educators and developers to create a platform for you to learn things like Docker, like OpenStack, like just DevOps in general, Perl, Python, Ruby, rsync backups, the basic Linux administration, Apache, Nginx. They have coursewares on all of this stuff. They have live streams that you can watch and ask the educators questions directly. You can choose from 7 plus Linux distributions. They have scenario-based labs at Linux Academy. So not only do they have standard lab servers, you'll receive access to their scenario-based labs that put you in the middle of tasks common to everyday environments. So you'll actually get real experience with these scenario-based labs. They also have a really, really great community. So if you're maybe slowing down a little bit or having a downtime, that community can kind of give you that boost you need. It's really neat. And I've been able to kind of jump in there and get my feet wet from time to time and get an idea of what kind of things I might want to pursue. And in fact, this recently happened to me with Ruby, where I was like, I, I, I feel like maybe it's time. I just, I don't want to get stagnant, maybe keep myself moving forward, pick, some, pick a new skill set to pick up. But I thought, you know, really, it'd probably be very beneficial for me to learn a little development. I've always been sort of been able to roughly read some stuff, but I can't really do much more than that. And I thought, well, we have some Ruby uh, use in-house. Maybe I should learn Ruby. And it wasn't really until I went to Linux Academy and I saw, okay, this can take five hours and 30 minutes to learn Ruby. And I thought, what? I've got, f- I can figure like, out wow. five hours. Yeah. Like once <laughs> right? you put it in that, in that terms, like I can wrap my brain around that. That's a concept I get. And they'll let me set up a learning plan. So I just say how much time I have and then they'll work with me and they can do the same for you. It doesn't matter if you have a little time or a lot of time. Linux Academy is where you want to go. Check them out. Linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Go over there, get our special discount. I think you're going to be really impressed. Uh, I think, yeah, I know. I've been, you know, I, I know. I've been talking about Linux Academy. I've been talking about learning Ruby, and I'll tell you, I, I think that realization for me has just sort of re-cemented, cemented for me why I think this is such a great resource and why it can be such a great resource for you. Uh, and I want you to try it. I want you to have that moment. It's extremely empowering. It gives you a, a level of control over your future that I, I think if, you're, if you don't have that, it's worth going over there and trying it for a little while. Uh, I, I don't have a better way to put it. It was, it was extremely gratifying to know that I could set a goal for myself and that this was a tool that would help me accomplish that goal. Uh, and it's not a bullshit goal either. It's actually making myself better, educating myself, and learning something new. I would like all of you to experience that. Go over to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Get our special discount. Thanks to Linux Academy for sponsoring the Linux Unplugged show. I think you guys will be really impressed. 
All right. So, uh, Mr. Popey, I got to ask you now. We've we've talked a lot of good stuff. Is there any disclaimers you want to make about like expectations? Like, if I buy one of these, is there maybe going to be performance issues? You think it's going to work okay? So the first thing I'd say is don't expect every single app you've got on, you know, whatever phone you currently use to yeah. be there. Okay. We we do, you know we're realistic about this you know we're new to the market and we don't have the app ecosystem that, that the other platforms have we just don't yet have the skype and the whatsapp you know they're not there yet so you do have telegram um, <laughs> you have yeah. telegram which is really cool yeah that's a neat mobile it's a really app nice grab. app as well yeah it's it's uh open source it's the codes on launchpad you can you know contribute if you want to if you want to add features that that you've seen in other telegram apps then knock yourself out and it even does badge like little numbers for unread yep. messages and yep. the that's really cool I yeah like and that. you get notifications and all that kind of all stuff. right so that's a good disclaimer you're not going to have all your apps probably pretty expected uh you could probably fill in some of the gaps with web apps but it's just probably not quite there it's not going to be there for a while but that's pretty expected i think Right. And and part of this is, you know, I think some of the we do, we do have uh, conversations with software vendors all the time. You know, we have a, a team of people who are constantly discussing, you know, you should bring your app to Ubuntu or you should bring your framework to Ubuntu or whatever it is. And so we're, we're constantly having those conversations and we know that they're those companies are are um, keeping an eye on Ubuntu, shall we say? Yeah. Kind of seeing where things go and uh I uh, I have noticed what what the hell is it about you guys where you manage to get just manage to get attention like no other company in the Linux space does like I, I mentioned to you today on the pre-show I was just digging around for stories for Tech Talk and I just kept coming up with all these various outlets that are not even really attached to the Linux or the open source community necessarily talking about it like for example the one that stood out with me this morning was I was going over some Bitcoin headlines and one of the top Bitcoin headlines one of the top stories in Bitcoin today was the launch of the Ubuntu Touch Phone and if there was a Bitcoin wallet available for it. <laughs> <laughs> like, isn't That's that awesome. interesting to just see how it permeates? It seems to reach out to a level of consumers. It's not like Apple or Microsoft level of reach, but it seems like a wider reach than pretty much anybody else in the Linux space gets. And I've seen a lot more people I talking think, about Ubuntu Touch than I would have expected. I think partly the fact that it's that, uh, real Linux device, you know, uh, yeah, I know Android is Linux at heart, really, yeah. but it, it is a real Linux device in that, you know, you can SSH into it and do all the kinds of stupid stuff that you would do on a normal Linux machine. And, and that actually enables quite a lot of creativity for, for in terms of what you want to run on the device. And, and you talking about the Bitcoin wallet, there is a Bitcoin wallet in the store and it's been in the store for a long, long time, about 18 months. It's been there. Um, is there a developed. central place I can go to find all the apps available for my Ubuntu phone? There is, uh, we, we haven't made a web front end yet, ah, but yeah. someone in the community uh, looked at our store API and built one for us. So there is one and you can go to it and I'll give you the link and you can put it in the show notes okay. and you can browse the apps that are in the store and you can okay. see the ratings and all the kinds of stuff that you would see on like iTunes on, okay. on and, the web. Uh, Q5, you had a question, right? Yeah, now I'm going to frame this, Popey, in that let's say this Ubuntu phone is incredibly successful. We're five years down the road. There's multiple devices out there. My question has to do with that because one thing I've noticed with Android devices is you buy a device, you load it up with apps, everything runs great. A couple years go by, even though the you know your, your hardware is the same, the apps run like poo because of the automatic updates. The programmers, the developers of the applications are now building them for the newer hardware, which then doesn't run on what you have. And I'm wondering if, as you know, Ubuntu has you know older software updates for older repos, if there's going to be something similar on the phone side of things, so that if you get a phone, you don't have to worry about a semi-planned obsolescence because applications are being updated and basically update to the point where your hardware can't run them anymore. So it's it's a great question. And I've been bitten by that myself. I have an iPad first generation mm. and there's half a dozen apps on there mm -hmm. that I just cannot run anymore because yeah. Yeah. when I first run them, they say, you need to update me. And when you try and update them, it says, oh, you need iOS 7 or you need iOS 8 or something. And so, yeah, I can appreciate that problem. One of the... One of the issues there, there's a few issues. One is that, you know, we can't necessarily control what app developers do. If they want, if they see a new uh, device that comes on the market that has a 4K screen and 128 gig of storage and a 
16 core CPU and they want to do something amazing with that, whatever it might be. Let's say they make the most amazing touchscreen video editor on Linux on a phone <laughs> that's got that kind of yeah. specs. Then, yeah, I would expect that to run like a pig on the BQ device because this is a 960 by 440 display with a few cores and one gig of RAM. So that you're going to have a bad time. And, and I don't <laughs> think that's our, you know, department to start telling app developers, no, 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 no. You need to write your, your apps as if you're running Motif on, you know, on a Pentium 200 in order to, you know, come into our app store. I don't think mm. that's what she, we should be doing. We should foster innovation and, you know, the advancement of more complex and fun and interactive and useful applications on the device. I don't think we should rein them in. In terms of the platform, we are trying to keep our platform as lean as possible. And as I said before, having this as our first device helps us to get to that goal because we've committed to continuing to maintain uh, this device. It's not like... I'm not trying to throw stones, but with the Firefox OS first phone that I bought, the ZTE Open, there's no updates for it. Whereas mm. the Firefox Flame, I can move to Firefox OS 2.0, but I have no way of doing that that I'm aware of on the ZTE Open. And we don't want to be in that situation where we leave devices behind. No, my question wasn't, are you going to force developers to, you know, maintain, uh, you know, like you can't, do anything newer on your programs because of older devices. What I'm specifically asking is, will there be a way, unlike, for instance, the Google Play Store, where once an application is updated, you do not have the option to reuse the older version if your phone auto-updated unless you can somewhere find the APK online to be able to sideload it? Like, will, right. when an application is updated, will the original older version still be available for those who don't have the money to go out and buy that new 4K right. phone? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. And we're, we're working on the best way to do that. You know, whether we, should, whether we need to support having multiple different versions of the same app in the store to support different versions of the framework or different versions of the uh, devices that we've got out in in you know consumer land uh we haven't got a solution for that at the moment my workaround is that i personally mirror all of the clicks in the store every single day so i have a copy of every version ah, okay. of every <laughs> app that's in the store on my home server uh, you know that's hmm. my personal way of doing it hmm. uh but uh yeah you you but depending you on a, your a, a depending on your geek level right you might be able to manually back up those click packages uh yeah like if, i mean like if i wanted the old version of telegram for some reason i could maybe somehow keep that telegram. yeah i mean it's you can we've got the tools you can you can get a click package and you can sideload it over a usb cable and just type a command and it installs it you know i i have done that today installed loads of because i wanted to test the upgrade process i installed a load of old apps on the phone and then went through the upgrade process so yeah you, you can do that kind of thing we do make it possible for you to sideload old versions of stuff is that something nice. that canonical will try to well, would they have a problem if someone in the community took up that role of hosting all the older versions, or would they be okay with that? Well, what you got to remember is that the packages in the store are uh, licensed under uh, certain terms, and they're not necessarily all GPL. The so, developers, would yeah, some that, of them. Right? Yeah, it's up to them whether their apps are, you know, distributable, redistributable or not. You know, that and now it's something you would have to check. You know, there's actually some some decent apps that I use, like uh, Readability and Inst there's an Instapaper web app in here. There's a Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, some of these are web apps to be sure, but hey, you know, a web app's fine as long as it takes me right to it. For the most part, I don't need <laughs> things to be native for like Rotten Tomatoes. Right, and there's a few games. You know, we need. I I would love for there to be more games on there because you know I'm I'm the same as anyone. I sit there and when I'm bored, I pick up my phone and start playing stupid games. There's a couple of really good <laughs> ones. There's uh, there's one called Machines vs Machines, which is a really nice um, desktop tower defense game, which is inf infuriating. And I'm almost 100 percent certain Canonical have lost a lot of productivity over the last uh, <laughs> month or so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> having that game in there. Um, yeah. I like this a lot. Uh, this is really neat. It is, uh, the, I'll have a link to this app store web. I mean, pulling in the reviews here. This is really tiny, tiny RSS app. Very nice. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I mean, and the nice thing that that store nobody asked him to do that. He just noticed that we had a well documented API for the store, and so he created his own his own web front end and uh, put it on GitHub, so anyone can uh, can can do that. I've noticed a couple of other. Uh, Questions in the IRC, do you want yeah, to yeah, answer Yeah, yeah, please do. So Anagogo says, uh, is there tethering? The answer is yes and no. There isn't a GUI for it at the moment, but I think it is possible with a couple of commands you can tether to the device. Um, and we, we do plan to have it so that you can press buttons in order to 
tether in the same way as you would expect to do that on other devices. And the other question is, is there a mobile terminal? Yes, yes, of course there is. So, so it seems like uh, uh, for a lot of us, the selection of apps won't be a big deal. But for the average consumer, like you know, an Audible app is kind of important. Maybe Waze or something like that. That's going to be the big fight. But I guess that only gets solved after some hardware has been on the market for a little while, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And once you've got a couple of those out there, and you can go to places like MWC or GDC or you know any of the conferences over the next six months and start waving the device around and say, look, you know, we've got this uh, open hardware, open platform with you know hardware in the in the market, and you know here's our SDK, and you know here are people who've developed apps, and here's a selection of code that you could look at to show you how to develop your own apps. Maybe so, we can get people ported. I mean, I I thought I understood the difference. I thought I understood what a scope was. But I got to tell you, some of these apps in here that are called scopes look like apps. I don't know. It's like this Gmail scope looks like an app to me. But this is just a scope. Right. What does that mean? Yeah. So so the scopes uh, are a way, you know, when you showed that video earlier, yeah. the the, uh, the people in the video were just looking at scopes. They were yeah. just uh, take the phone out of the pocket and swipe to one side. Right. So you just swipe across, check what the weather's like. It's all about right. um, specific you know, the like information of, at your fingertips, right? Kind of like Google. Right. And things I've heard you it explained as rituals. Google now without the creepy. <laughs> and the and the rituals you do every day like you know you check what the weather's going to be like before you get before you get up you you know you might uh see what appointments you have that day to see whether you need to wear a suit or where you can dress down so you check your calendar and you know all these kind of like little things that ordinarily might be siloed away in lots of different applications like i have to open the weather app or i have to open my calendar app or right, I, right. I have to go and check my email app and and rather than you have to open each of these apps one after the other that information is pushed to the front screen so it's just a case of swipes swipe swipe and you know you see that information right there i think that's that's the key goal is and that's where the whole you know your information at your fingertips mm -hmm. is just a, a quick swipe away but rather than having to dig deep in apps isn't that isn't that canonical saying in a way and i'm not saying it's a bad thing but isn't that canonical in a way saying you know what guys some stuff doesn't need to be an app your your stuff is is a feature it's not it's not a dedicated app just write a scope it kind of feels like a little bit like saying to developers sorry your app i know you want to brand it and you want to have a yahoo weather app and you want to give everybody the yahoo weather experience but really people just want to know if it's going to rain that should just be in a scope is that kind of the message there? yeah do you think yeah, partly, you know, especially as, uh, and you can aggregate data from multiple scopes. So, you know, I could say, well, I, 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 I like the, um, the weather reports I get from Yahoo, and I like the weather reports I get from the Weather Channel, but I also like knowing how windy it's going to be. So there's this we this website where I go to find out what the wind's going to be like. So when I go surfing, you know, I have a, a better idea, and Yahoo don't show me that kind of data. So it's nice to be able to aggregate all yeah. of that kind of information so you can get multiple perspectives on the same piece of data, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I do like that. You get uh, you can get uh, alternative opinions, and uh, of course, uh, one thing you'd the first app you'd want to get for your Ubuntu Touch device is the Jupiter Broadcasting app. Well, of course, obviously, uh, which is pretty cool, and it actually resizes pretty well too. Uh, I think this is and this app this app is really well done. Uh, the authors put uh, uh, you know the host information right there, and it's just a really well done app. It's really cool. It's it's one of the, it's I think one of our best mobile apps out there. Of course, I love all our mobile apps. But I think it's one of our best, on, and it's on Ubuntu Touch right now. So the author of that, Simon, mm -hmm. was actually one of the insiders. Uh, we invited him along. So he's one of the people who got invited last Friday to come along and get a, a, a phone and the headphones and, and all that. And get, awesome. And, uh, nice. and meet everyone. So I'm yeah, glad it was a little that's... kind of thank you for, yeah. yeah. I'm glad because I know working with him on that app, he was super excited about the platform, or he is super excited about the platform. So Yeah. And, and the other nice thing is what we've said to all these people who came along last Friday, it's important to know that they're all, they're not all yes men they're not all people who we've said you must say positive things about ubuntu we've given them the phone they can say whatever they right. like yeah. you know we've had people posting youtube videos telling us that the boot performance is bad or yeah. Yeah. telling us that the scrolling performance is bad that's exactly what we want we want them to tell us their experience not tell us only the positive things tell us right. what's wrong with it as right. well you got to fix that fix stuff it. too yeah, yeah exactly that's, that's good that's a good outlook to have about it i think uh, I uh, I wonder if uh, you know if 
I, I, I even think a podcast app could be a scope thing. I mean, I, I, that's a fascinating thing that I think I want to play with more as I get the device. And I wonder if I as- well, yeah, there there is a ge- there is a generic podcast app um, that's written by Mike Sheldon, who's one of the one of our employees. Is that the Podbird one? screen keyboard. Is that Podbird? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and I think he's looking at developing a scope as well, so you could just scroll across. Like first thing in the morning on your commute, you just scroll across to your podcast scope and it lists all the you know upcoming episodes or what's yeah. what's new in the, yeah. in the podcast and you can just hit the button and hit play rather than having to go squirreling around within right. your podcast app yeah. so uh the, the other thing i think of is and then, then i'm then i'm then all my questions are done and we can then i'll, I'll, let, I'll let the other people then we'll wrap up but uh anyways yeah, i'm sure thing. people are sick of hearing about it I'm yeah sure. yeah <laughs> uh one of the things like i know whenever we're writing apps for platforms is what kind of what kind of features is the platform just going to give me for free can it just do video playback like if i just say put a video element here will it just do video playback or do i have to write the player figure out how i'm going to pull down the mp4 file figure out how i'm going to break that up and play it to the user especially when i'm moving on connections is there like you know like on iOS, there's like a core video right. and a core audio. Is there anything like that on Ubuntu right. Touch yet, or is that in development? Yeah, there is. So we have a bunch of core services that uh, the platform provides. So, for example, uh, there's location services. So that if you develop a map app, you just request the location, and the user gets prompted to say, "Do you want this app to know your location?" And you accept or deny, and yeah, you know, then you're done. And the app can then find out your location and that that location detection is provided by our location service right. okay. similarly if you if you're writing a podcast app and you want to be able to download um you know video podcasts that take a very long time to to download you can uh, use the download service so when you choose to when the developer chooses to download a a long video podcast it downloads in the background and then when it finishes it signals to the app that it's done hmm. um what was the other one? Oh, media playback. So yeah, we have a media hub, uh, which does audio playback. Uh, we have uh, video playback as well. And we also have a media scanner service. So if you put your music on the device, it will scan all your music, figure okay. out what all the ID3 tags are, go and get the artwork, all that kind of stuff as well. Ooh, that's really cool. And then last but not least, uh, how much do you want one of these cases that has the cutout for the notification thing? That is really cool. I had cool. no idea that thing existed. It turns out the BQ guy who was at the thing last Friday had one, and uh, I, d- I just didn't notice it. He, uh, it's, yeah. The so Ubuntu Touch phone one. gets its own exclusive phone case with a custom cutout for that little notification ring. That's pretty How cool. sweet is that? That's really cool. <laughs> That's awesome. That is neat. All right. Anybody in the mum room have any questions for Pope before we wrap up on the Ubuntu Touch? I do. Okay, go ahead, W. And Pope, you uh, can answer or not answer. It's totally up to you. Okay, uh, my uh, my questions are: uh, If we import this to the U.S., if like one of us decides to, would I be able to like put it on Ting or some other mobile network? And how good is like the Wi-Fi on this? If let's say I just don't want to use a mobile network and um, just use it on Wi-Fi just to contact people online. So you could you could get it shipped to the US, and in fact, we have some of our employees who are in the US who use it. Um, the downside is because uh, the US uses different frequencies for 3G, you'd only get um, GSM 2G. Mm. Um, it does have Wi-Fi, so yes, it'll do uh, 2.4 I think and five gig. I, th- I I'd, I'd have to check that, but um, yeah, it does it does Wi Fi perfectly. I I uh, mine mine is mostly on my my Wi Fi actually. I think it's only two point four. Yeah, it doesn't do five gig. It's two point four. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's not too uncommon when you're bringing a phone over. Kind of depends on what bands are in it. And then lastly, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a bummer. Yeah, you know, we uh, unfortunately. It's um, it's it's a bit out of our control. <laughs> that one. Okay, I, I had one last question. Uh, could you do you have any insights to share about the integrated traffic data uh, service that's going to be shipping with the phones in the UK? And is that something we're going to see more of? Where maybe Canonical has a bit of a hole in in something the phone does that maybe some of the shipping ones already do, and so instead you just partner with somebody who does that, like like. Ironix here with uh, traffic data. Can you do you know anything right. about this? Uh, you know, I I learned about that from OMG Ubuntu. So Joey, who runs okay. OMG Ubuntu, came last Friday as well, and you know he writes a blog post or uh, tweets about something. And I think, oh, that's cool. I didn't know we did that. Yeah. So yeah, the, these I insiders was... are not just not, you know I don't know. Maybe there was an announcement that I missed because we've all been heads down for the phone. Yeah, release, they say but, they say yes. it's a partnership with I, INRX uh, to do or INRX or whatever to do the traffic. And I think that when I saw that, I was like, that seems like hey, you know what? We have a gap here. 
and we can plug it with a partnership makes sense to me. Right. And that's exactly what we did for the location services. So we, you know how um, Android have, Google have their own uh, location services and Apple have their own location services. We partnered with Nokia here for our location services. So they provided some software to us that allows us to do the fast fix location detection so that it does a gps when you're you know when you're out and about and yeah. near wi-fi exit points it can find you pretty quickly yeah. without that it would take a long time to get a gps lock it's yeah. pain, painfully long so we partnered with them so yeah there is a there is a precedent for us partnering with other companies to provide services for the phone hmm. uh okay any last questions for mr pope before we wrap this thing up I think you just sold you sold me on it. <laughs> oh, it sounds awesome! Yay! Yeah. Oh, and we have a torch app, so you know every, that Good. that base is covered Good. as well. Yes, got to got to be able to make sure I can find my way in the dark. Uh, yeah, so uh, very cool and exciting to see an actual ship date. So tomorrow's the day. Yep. Oh my uh, gosh! Of Feb. Oh my gosh! Oh oh really? So then there'll be another. So there's going to be another one later. Uh, want, maybe. Yeah. Want? I got to figure out what those times are. Pacific time, and then I'm going to set an alarm, and I want to try to get one. I mean, seems like a, we've all been waiting for so long, right? And it's not—it's under two hundred dollars, so it's a pretty good deal. Yeah, it's it's pretty cheap, really. You know, one hundred and twenty-six pounds. What is it? One hundred and sixty-nine euros. I don't yeah. know what that is in funny money you have over there, but <laughs> yeah, it's not—it's not ridiculously <laughs> expensive. No, no, it's pretty cool to see it actually come to fruition. Um, all right. Well, I think we'll wrap it up right there. Uh, and uh, if I get one eventually, I'll give you a review. Uh, however it is and i'll watch it as it goes i, I kind of the other, the other reason i kind of want to bq so i can get the you know i can get updates and kind of track the progress as the platform matures because there's going to be things that'll be pushed out as you know they find stuff and it'd be good to keep track yeah. of that so very true i'll give you a report next week if i manage to grab one it's already tomorrow here says juba in the chat room well that's true that's a little confusing and the people could be listening at any time we're talking show. to people in the future i mean yeah. how cool is that we're right? time travelers that's we're time, right we're time travelers we'll poke Buck rogers got thank you on uh, Thank you for letting us pick your brain all that stuff, yeah. Poppy. It was a it was a good download of information. Yeah, oh, thank you. Cheers, guys. Yeah, congratulations to you and everybody over there to kind of awesome. the team for uh, working your asses off to get this far. Uh, I think if nothing else, that's a hell of an accomplishment. Just right there. Uh, all right. Well, then we'll wrap it up here on the Linux Unplug Show. We'd love to have you visit us. Why don't you join us? You know, you could do this with us. Yeah, you could. Come over to the website Tuesdays. We start at 2 p.m. Pacific and go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that in your local time zone. And join us in that there IRC chat room. Share your opinions as we go. Or even better, join us in the mumble room. And maybe we can hear you and what you actually think about these things. Because I think we have a pretty smart audience. You probably have a pretty educated opinion on a lot of this stuff. Why not contribute? We're just going to check your mic. You can also go to linuxactionshow.reddit.com and uh, submit content that way. Matt, have a yes. great week. I'll talk to you next week. Sounds good. See you then. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. We'll see you right back here next Tuesday. I've got a uh, a ten thousand dollar Ethernet cable to sell you. Are you ready for this for a ten thousand oh, dollar Ethernet cable? Yeah. Let me get my checkbook. Okay, now here's good. the good thing, Matt. Uh, if you if you're willing to pay ten thousand dollars for this Ethernet cable, not only am I going to include <laughs> data in this Ethernet cable, but Ooh. for no additional charge on top of the ten thousand, I'm also going to give you high fidelity audio. Mm-hmm. Nice. This better can be I, a unidirectional can... one because I don't want any of your cheap <laughs> bidirectional Ethernet cables. All right. yeah, They're okay. rubbish. Now that I've got you interested, I should probably disclaim it's actually ten thousand five hundred dollars for this cable. <laughs> Ooh. It's got Ooh. an RJ forty five connector made from silver with tabs that are virtually <laughs> oh, unbreakable. The plug comes with the added strain relief and a firm lock to keep it in place. That way, no critical data is lost. Silver, huh? I'm going to wager this is put out by Monster. <laughs> I'm just call that a hunch. You know, know with their gold silver, cables and all this crap. I mean, oh my gosh! All it right. makes it sound better. Wow, oh, it does whatever. look amazing, though. This does look like the. It's got a really cool braided cable too. This is the coolest looking HD or uh, Ethernet cable I've ever seen. I'd probably wear it like Mr. T. I'll be honest with you. Audio Quest Diamond. Yeah, you could. It could be a piece of jewelry. All right, JBTitles.com. I have a feeling it's going to be something to do with the Ubuntu phone. I don't know. Uh,
Could be. Yeah, yeah. So you know, how, uh, you know how I uh, talk about Chrome and how I like Chrome? Oh, you're a Chrome maniac. Yeah. So Chrome. over the weekend, my Chrome profile just got corrupted for some reason. And oh, now fuck. every time I launch Chrome, it thinks it's launched for the first time ever, which <laughs> is not like un- unusable because it syncs so well and so fast that yeah. all of my stuff syncs back. But the one thing I really end up missing is my URL autocompletion. And the reason why that's handy is, turns out, like, I need to type while I'm doing a podcast often. And it's really yes. nice if I could just type in JBT, and then JB Titles yep. is automatically, and I just hit enter, because that way I don't, otherwise I'm over here going like, hey, welcome to, uh, hold on, I gotta, uh, hold on, I'm typing. All right, welcome so to the did show. You not, did you not restore your um, Chrome profile from your backup? My what? <laughs> yeah, I thought so. Well, it's a fun trick that I've used. I've never done this on Chrome, but I used to do it in Firefox a lot. And I, I keep like multiple. I, I create what yeah, I call the generic profile. Yep. And then I got all my autocompletes done, and then I move them away. And that mm. way, when it goes to crap, and it will, um, there you go. Yeah. Uh, of course, I'm paranoid, and I wear a tinfoil hat. So Ubuntu is calling is not bad. Uh, Ubuntu yeah, phone's good. arrival is also pretty good. I like both of those. I like Ubuntu calling. It's cool. Ubuntu is calling. Uh, it's very Avon. It's, it's kind of working for me. The Ubuntu blob phone. Oh, my gosh. It's already starting. <laughs> it's already starting. <laughs> it's negative in the freedom dimension. Yep, yep. Uh, Ahoy, Ubuntu. All right, jbtitles.com. Suck my googs. No, I'm not going to suck my googs. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. And I just got that out of my brain, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Yep. Well, like, Jeez, me, you guys. Baby. Hey. Might as well, might, you know what? We started uh, with it. We might as well end with it, right? Yeah. Well. It's, it's the circle. It's the circle of life. <laughs> circle of googs.